guys, we're back. Mark and Taylor for another episode of Decaf. Mark, do you have your coffee this morning? Because I'm struggling so hard. I don't stay golden. Uh, I'm doing the white peach uptime. Oh my gosh. The energy drink. So I ordered po- coffee from Postmates this morning because I didn't have any in my house. And I, I know I ordered. I, I, I love that. I respect okay. that. I had to. I ordered a cup of hot coffee and I ordered an iced latte to drink in a little while and a cinnamon roll <laughs> and because I didn't want to leave my house. So I just ordered it and it was delivered because it's like gross outside and I didn't want to leave. So by the way, have you ever had proper bagel? Have I ever had proper bagel? Please. So that's, can you just answer the question? Just yes. yes that would be good. <laughs> exactly. um, I'm assuming that's a yes. I just ordered it for the first time. Like I'm from Philadelphia. So I always had like the New York bagels and they're so good. And Every bagel I've had here has just been just not even here, but anywhere outside of basically New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. And their bagels are fantastic. Their bagel sandwiches are unbelievable. Like they're, I don't know if they're quite as good, but they're really close. And for the area we're in, like they're unreal good. They're so good. And they put all those like fresh things on them. Like everything they put on it is so fresh. Like their, their breakfast bagels, they like, they're not like scooping scrambled eggs out of something they cooked hours ago. They're like making the eggs. Oh, it's so good. Yeah, I'm a big it fan. It really is. And I also, I also just had, uh, um, I just got something, a bagel, which was not that good, but I got a butterbeer coffee with it and a butterbeer latte. And it was so good. You would like that. I bet it's got like so much sugar in it. God, yeah, it's probably like 14 million calories, but it was delicious. So <laughs> you loved it. If you ever come to Nashville, this, this sounds like a plug, but it, it, um, proper bagel is unbelievably good. And I was there's a point because I wanted to get it ordered last week but i guess it was the road was closed because the uh, the presidential debate they weren't delivering i'm like oh i just want a proper bagel so bad that's amazing i might have to order one of those later today for my lunch that sounds so good how many breakfasts are you gonna have today why don't you just wait till tomorrow well because you're talking about it now i want it <laughs> <laughs> i do i do like breakfast sandwiches not for breakfast though They're yes good. exactly breakfast all day man breakfast yeah. all day um <laughs> That's a that's my hot take of the day, breakfast all day. Um, so let's move on to our first topic. We've talked about this a lot. We've talked about social media censoring. We talked about it a couple of weeks ago. This week, um, the major tech CEOs, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg, Jack Dorsey, and Google CEO went and testified before Congress. And um, I won't use any four letter words on the podcast, but it was it was some kind of something. It was. There was some yelling, there was some hostility, and honestly, I think it was somewhat warranted. Mark, do you have any opinions on that? I I didn't watch much of it. I do remember the last time they came in, which is probably like four years ago, and and basically these senators are like, hey, so if I go on my computer and click on the and click on the button, is that Facebook? Like like people who just had no idea what they were even asking questions about. Um so I, I don't know if it was warranted. I've seen some different takes. Some people are saying, well, look, it's it's not a freedom of speech issue. It's not related to the government. Mm-hmm. Um, but other people are saying, well, it's if they're not being clear about what they are or if it's a publisher. It, I mean, it's a pretty complicated, I think, issue generally. Um, the one thing that I took out of it was I saw Mark Zuckerberg basically ask for more regulation of, of Facebook. And, it's, um, and that should tell you that a lot of times regulation helps the big guys and hurts the small guys. It helps stamp out competition. And when you see big time CEOs asking for their, um, asking for themselves to be regulated, what is the reason behind it? They can self-regulate if they want. They're choosing not to because they understand that regulations will, that will allow them to stay in business and it will take away the market share of anybody else. And it makes it, more, it's not a monopoly because people again don't understand what a monopoly is, but it makes it more like a monopoly when you put these gigantic regulations that don't allow other people to get in the market. So that was the one thing I took away is anytime a CEO of a company asks for regulation, you need to think about why that's the case because they can always regulate themselves that way. They're choosing not to. So what is the reason they need a government to do it and generally to put their smaller competitors out of business? I actually wrote that down on my notes. Zuck wants regulation. That's what I wrote to bring that up, but we're on the same page. Another thing that I thought was interesting was a lot of the takes on social media. This one guy said, he posted a picture of Jack Dorsey who looks like Andy Bernard did after he spent those three months <laughs> in the <elbow. laughs> That's a great reference. That does look- <laughs> That's exactly what he looks like. And this guy said, imagine being, this is what the tweet said. 
imagine being ruled by a guy that looks like this. And it made a lot of people think and say, imagine thinking that you're ruled by the Twitter CEO, the CEO of a company that you choose to be on and you choose to read their content and you're, you're making a choice to be ruled by him. It just goes to show how people view social media these days as the definitive be all end all voice of our society, of our generation. I mean, if you log off Twitter and go talk to real people, I talked to someone the other day, he's from California and I just met him the first time and we were just chatting and he goes, I'm gonna be honest, outside of social media, no one in California cares about COVID. And I was like, what? And he was like, people virtue signal and post about their masks all the time. But in California, people just don't care. People are going about their business. They want their restaurants to be open, but they post about hashtag wear a mask just to fit in with society, but no one really cares. And I thought that was really interesting because we read all the time about get off Twitter, get off Facebook, get off Instagram, and go talk to a real person. And you'll see that that it is what it is. People don't really care as much as they say they care. Um, even the other day, I was unfollowed by someone that I know for posting something on social media about my political views. And um, I was talking to some of our friends who disagree with us. And they said, you're not ruled, you, like you're not defined by your political views. And so um, it just goes to show we just really need to get off social media and actually talk to real people. I, th I think the one thing I've noticed too, which is not, it's, this is not a policy thing, but it's like, the lives that you see of people on social media, that's not the real lives they live. A lot of times, a lot of times these people, like the people who post all the times about their relationships are usually the people who are the least happy mm -hmm. about them. Um, the people who post like, oh man, my life's so great are usually the most depressed people. It's just not, I, I think kind of like you said, it's not a real, that's not the real world. It, it's kind of the world that people want you to think. Like people might say, oh, it's so important to wear a mask, but then they don't do it themselves. So I, I think that you can take social media with a grain of salt. I don't, again, I still think there, there is a lot of good things that come from social media. Yes, I think, agreed, I think it's agreed. irresponsible to say it's all bad, but I think that you need to go in with the mindset of this is not real life. Uh, some of these things are good. Sometimes it's great to have discussions and see what your friends from high school are doing and things like that, but it's not real life. And when, and too many people kind of view their lives through this lens of social media instead of, like you said, living in the real world. So that's more of a philosophical thing than talking about the Twitter hearings, but it's just, it's just a fact. No, I agree. And I think that social media is one of those necessary evils. But at the same time, especially in this season where people are at each other's throats constantly, the social media seems like a safe place for people to post because you don't have to like interact with people one to one. If you do, it's in a direct message and it's nothing. But get off social media and actually interact with people. And I feel like people would be a lot less angry because we're all humans. Yeah. And I also, one more thing. I don't think we're as divided as a country as we seem on social media. That's one thing I keep saying. There is division, and I don't think there's any doubt about that. But I think when you look at the political parties, like, you see the worst of the worst people from both sides of social media and the flamethrowers, the people who go back and forth. But I don't think that's what most people are like. And, and that's why I have more, I don't know, maybe more confidence in what we're going to be as a country than other people do. And I'm more optimistic because I don't think social media is a good indicator of how we are as a country. That's it. I agree. I agree with Mark. That's so funny that we agree on something. I love it. I'll let you have the mic drop there. Another thing we agree on that we talk about a lot is sports. Now we don't love the same teams, mm -hmm. but we both love sports. And I went a couple weeks ago, as everyone knows, to the Braves game. Um, the next three games after that, the Braves choked really bad. Um, and the Dodgers ended up winning the World Series. Now, as sports fans, we know that you always want the team that gets you out of the playoffs to be the one that wins because it. No, th no, that's a great. No, we need to discuss that. I actually had this argument with Kira. Like, do you, when, when your team loses in the playoffs, I think people either cheer for them and say, oh, we lost to the champions, or they cheer against. It was like, screw those guys. They beat us. I want them to lose no matter what. I had the opposite view of you on that. I, I cheer against the team that beat me. Really? Yes. I always cheer for the team to beat me because I'd rather be taken out by the best. But who cares? If you if you didn't win, who cares? And, and like the Nuggets came back to be the Jazz. I was cheering as hard as they could. And I love the underdog, as you know. I was cheering for like the heavy favorites. I'm like, please take the Nuggets out. I'm done with their garbage. They shouldn't be here. My team should have won. And the farther they go, I'm going to be more depressed. I, I don't know. I cheer absolutely against the team that beats me. That is so odd. I really thought we were going to agree on this. No, I, I think that you're actually on the... I think you're on the wrong side of this. I think most people, if you took a poll, would say they'd rather cheer against the team that beat. I mean, think about the SEC things. Like, they, everyone hates the teams that beat them, and they cheer against them. Like, no, I don't want – like, I think most people 
I'd say 80% of people, if you lose in the playoffs, you would cheer against that team, not for them. That is wild. As actually, we had Dennis Ferrier with Fox 17 News at our Young Professionals event earlier this week. And we were talking about this because he is a big Dodgers fan. And I told him that I am for the Dodgers because they bested the Braves and I want to get beat by the best. That is wild that we disagree on this. I think that you don't understand how much of the minority you're in on this one. I think it's about, and I know that Justin's here for the Dodgers, but Justin didn't cheer for the Dodgers because they beat them. He just said they, they've been a set like, team going up. Normally, I think he would cheer against, if you asked him, he would cheer against the team that beat them. But even in high school, like when we would play football in high school, I would always cheer for the team that beat us in the playoffs to win the state championship because you want to know that the, the best team, like you want to be up there with the best teams instead of being like. But you're not. You didn't win. Who cares who wins? If you're not the champion, it, it does. if you come in second place, you don't get a second place trophy. Who cares? Yeah. And I mean, in, in fairness, the Dodgers – I think arguably are like the best team in the last five years. And basically they've lost two world series, but both those teams were caught cheating. So it, it, I mean, they had a great team. They have a really solid team. And honestly, I was more impressed. The Braves were that competitive because the Braves pitching staff was like devastated. I mean, I know. the pitchers got hurt. So to me, it was impressive that they played that close to them and watching the world series. I think it's, it's hard to argue that the Braves are not better than the Rays were. So, I mean, the Braves probably were the second best team in baseball this year. It doesn't matter because they didn't win, but they probably were the second best team. So you were, what you're saying is the game that me and Justin and Carol went to was, should have been the world series. Yeah. If they weren't, in the, yeah. If they were not in the same, if they were not in the same, um, same league. Yes. If, I was going to say division, but that's not how it works. And that's not how it works in baseball. Um, but, um yes. It was same, really the same national league. For all my LA friends, they had a banner year for sports. I mean, the Lakers, the Dodgers, like that was huge. I know that you hate the Lakers. Quite honestly, I hate them too. But I mean, I hate LeBron. Let me just be honest. I think yeah. people love him, but I can't stand him. But for the Lakers, this was a big year for them. I so mean, it, 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 it also helps when you spend more money than the other team, like both those teams did, that it, it makes it more likely to win. Money does matter. One of the cool things, though, about the World Series, which I, I wasn't necessarily cheering for them, but um, – um, the Rays beat the Yankees um, mm -hmm. last time in the series. Their whole starting lineup, their whole infield was paid less combined than the starting pitcher for the Yankees in game one, Garrett Cole. So their entire lineup was paid less than $13.5 million that, that year, which is what – so, like, they did it with almost no money, which is a great story. Like, these are all unheralded guys. Nobody on the Rays is like a, was a big name. Mm -hmm. um, they have one – They Blake Snell, the pitcher, who got paid a lot, is like a stud. But all the rest of the people just – they use that – if you ever saw that movie Moneyball with um, Chris Brad Pratt. Pitt. Yes, and Brad Pitt too, I guess, more important. But, like, that's that's what they use as they're like – and, like, so they made – it was cool to see them make the championship with a bunch of nobodies, no names that other people didn't want. And it was a cool story, even though they lost. Uh, honestly, that's cute, and I like it. I'm, I'm here for that. Um, <laughs> something that's not as cute of a story. Beacon is part of two new lawsuits. We filed one, and we signed an amicus brief with – or submitted an amicus brief with another one. Um, we have found – if you've been following Beacon for any amount of time at all, we found that there's really just like a really good three-pronged approach to all of the issues that we take on. There's the education approach. There's the um, legislative approach, which comes from our sister organization, Beacon Impact. And there's the litigation approach, which comes from the Beacon Center. And when cities or when the state does something that's like totally out of line and is not constitutional and is actually blatantly unconstitutional, but they somehow still think they can do it, we love to sue them. And that is what we are doing right now. Um, the city of Nashville a couple years ago, was it a couple years ago, Mark, or was it last year? 2019, I, mean, I think it was. It was in the past. That's all I Yeah. <laughs> filed a, or they passed a bill about sidewalks um, saying that if a person builds a house, they have to build a sidewalk in front of it. Basically a private citizen paying for a public utility, not cool. And so we said, not cool in court and then they changed the law a little bit thought they could get around it still not cool so we filed another lawsuit this week saying hey you're still wrong and um 
we're we're hoping and we're counting on the fact that the judge will see this as a constitutional issue because it is it's a property it's a blatant property rights issue when you're asking private citizens to pay for public utilities like sidewalks it's not cool yeah and, and what happened was i think after the first one basically it's like oh well you can apply for a hardship exemption if you basically don't have any money to, to build a sidewalk it's like that doesn't change any of the major issues here and yeah. if you don't build a sidewalk you have to pay some kind of like fine uh, to the city. And in but lieu of fee. It doesn't necessarily go to your specific sidewalk. It goes in this kind of, I, I guess, government slush fund that it would have to be a sidewalk in your general area, but it doesn't have to be your sidewalk. So like you could pay that, say, $8,000 and still not get a sidewalk. Exactly. It's, it's crazy how like it's getting lighter out there. I'm going from dark to like light real quick. Yeah. Around. So I, um, I know. But, now that we're talking about something, it's like in movies when the main yeah. character gets stronger, the light comes. <laughs> I think I need one of the halos over my head. I feel like that's that's what this is trying to tell everyone is that I am a saint. Um, no, but it is. It's a real problem, and it's uh, it, it's something that it doesn't really matter where you're at. Again, politically, it's this is not constitutional. You can't ask a private homeowner to pay a public for a public burden, and. It's all because Nashville's bankrupt. It's because they have no money because they can't afford sidewalks. It's not like they're doing this for some like, oh, we think it's that homeowners should pay for it. It's like, we don't have any money to pay for it. Someone needs to pay for it. I guess new homeowners or people like you can pay for it. That's not how the world works. I can't say like, oh, I, um, I really want my nails done, but I can't afford it, but it will make me look better for my job. So Beacon will pay for it. I'll put on my Beacon credit. Like that's not how things work. Sidewalks, yes, will make Nashville look better. But if you can't pay for them, then you can't get them. Like that's just not how the world works. And you want, and you want to talk about how social media, like you're out, outside of reality. The whole Nashville City Council is outside of reality too. They, they, have, no, they have no concept Sorry. of you can do, can't do. They don't understand money. I mean, it, it's this has just been a disaster. And Braden, uh, yep, uh, yesterday filed on behalf of two homeowners in Nashville. So it was a good day. We had there's a great story on Channel Four about it. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're, we're glad that we have Braden, uh, a great lawyer who stands up for for the rights of all Tennesseans. Yeah, and uh, you know, speaking of all Tennesseans, the next one that we signed on to is a case out of Memphis, where the CDC <laughs> just completely overstepped. Mark, what happened in that one? Well, yeah, so it was a federal case. Um, we signed on with an amicus brief, which basically means I think there's already a lawsuit. We're just kind of joining and saying we also agree with this lawsuit. And the whole point was that um, landlords are not allowed to evict people from their house. Um, and the big problem with that is not even the law itself, which, I mean, we probably disagree with, but that's not the point. The point is that they didn't pass this law in any kind of um, legislative capacity. The, the CDC basically told the courts like, oh, you cannot enforce this law that's on the books that you can evict people. So it's essentially an overstepping of a government agency, a basically a bureaucratic agency that needs to be done by lawmakers. So that's what the that's what the case said, and Beacon and Braden signed on to that. So we're not the ones who are filing the suit, but it's essentially we're agreeing with what they're filing. We're saying that we're also involved in this. I talk to my lefty friends all the time about the fourth branch of government and they don't believe me. Like I tell them all the time that a lot of the things that Beacon fights against are bureaucratic oversteps. Um, unelected bureaucrats. <laughs> exa well, exactly. Uh, by nature, bureaucrats. Yeah, unelected. So I tell them, I tell all my lefty friends all the time, like, the fourth branch of government exists. You don't learn about it in fourth grade U.S. history, but the fourth branch of government exists, and we have to deal with that a lot. And that's one of the things that we're dealing with in this issue is the fourth unelected branch of government that's saying what people can and can't do with their space. And, you know, we see it, sometimes we see it from, from, elected officials, like in California, there are new Thanksgiving rules that determine what you can and can't do in your own home. Like you have to sit six feet apart in your home and whatever. We see it from elected representatives and that's frustrating, but at least they're elected. When the when these bureaucrats- You them out if you choose to, yeah. Exactly. When these bureaucrats get up there and start running their mouths and telling you what you can and can't do, that's a problem. And that's an overstep and we don't like it. And we will always be here keeping a sharp eye out to, to watch what they're doing. Um, so last thing, we're going to talk about our favorite Halloween memories. And I just had this idea that like, you know, Ronald Reagan's quote, um, one of the scariest things you can hear is I'm from the government and I'm here to help. I should dress up <laughs> like a bureaucrat for Halloween one year and 
How would you go, to, go to like some libertarian Halloween party and say I'm a government bureaucrat. They would think it's funny. I want to be clear. A libertarian Halloween party sounds like the worst way I would ever want to spend Halloween. Well, yeah, that's why I would never go. <laughs> oh, yeah. But if you were forced to go to one that I would dress like a bureaucrat. <laughs> yes, that would be, yes. I guess just wear, I guess, glasses. I don't know. Yeah, I have a have a sticker on that says I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Um, I, I have a lot of good Halloween memories growing up in Anniston. There's this street in Anniston called Glenwood Terrace, and it's a really long residential street with a cute median down the middle and these lights. And the city would shut off all the roads that came into it. And so it was just trick or treat central, just people running up and down the street. There was a guy that would ride by as the headless horseman. Every okay. year he had this big jacket and would hide his head in it. And that was when trick or treating started when the headless horseman rode up and down the street. Oh, wow. It's like a whole, it's like it sounds it like a cool. whole, like, whole production cool. there. And my mom's best friend lived on the street. And so we always went there every year. She made chili and hot dogs. And then we could go out and trick or treat once the sun went down. It was just always a fun thing. Your Halloween yeah. tradition is chili and hot dogs? Yes, it is. That's a weird one, but okay, cool. It just is. And she made cupcakes with purple frosting and Halloween sprinkles on them. That was our Halloween tradition every year. I always, so I, I guess I don't, yeah, and I, I don't have one specific memory, but I just always remember the, the best thing when I was a kid was like, you would come home from school and it would be like, it's still light out. I came about 3.30. It's like, and you felt like that crisp air. It's like, and you got so excited because I went to Catholic school. So we had off the next day. So All Saints Day was always off for us. That's the first. And it's like, yeah, it's a holy day of obligation. So I went to Catholic school. So like we would go and it's like that at like four o'clock, like, oh my God, I can trick or treat all night. I'm so excited. And then I don't have to wake up or like eat. I can stay up all hours of the night eating candy and just have Great time, but I always the only reason I really I liked Halloween more than I would have otherwise was because it's like the perfect time of year. And I used to have my mom used to make pumpkin seeds, and I love that. So she would take the pumpkin seeds out and she would just salt them in this and, and cook them, and they always like a perfect crispy brown, but not too much. And I tried to do that, but it's so annoying getting them out of the pumpkin. Like this isn't worth it. I'll buy them, but then they're not hot, and they're they're. Right. Up worse when they're not heated up. So I wish I could find a way to replicate what my mom did, but I don't want to do the work. Yeah, well, that sounds like pretty much on brand for you. Were yes. you a candy eater or a candy saver? Oh, eater. Oh, yeah, yeah eater. I was a candy saver. Really? Like how I, you I would finish mine by Christmas. Oh my gosh. See, what I always had was like, I felt like I, I used to go out a lot and we had a lot of house in my neighborhood. So I used to eat a lot of candy and I would just eat as much as I could for like the first three days. And then I have a bunch left and then I'd be sick of candy. So I wouldn't eat it for like another five months. I go back in March. I'm like, Oh, okay. I'm okay to eat candy again. I, I'm probably over that three days of essentially vomiting up all my candy because I ate so much of it. <laughs> I remember one year we got legal pads and we wrote out candy and counted how much of each thing we had. So like boxes of nerds, like big Reese's, like I've always been type A. We like wrote out each type of candy that we had so that we knew how to ration them between then and Christmas. I was such a- What, what a cool way to have Halloween is used to <laughs> some rationing. What, that sounds like the, the fun that you expect from that. I just want to make it last. Want to make it last. Well, this year I had, there's like a little girl that lives across the street from us I'm gonna make some um rice crispy treats shaped as pumpkins I got my pumpkin cookie cutters in so I'm gonna do rice crispy treats shaped as pumpkins for the kids in our neighborhood because there's not many I was gonna say like that was the worst thing when I bought a house I'm like oh all kids trick or treat like I would have like five and that was even more annoying because they come like every 45 minutes I'm like okay well I just want to like just all come at once cook throughout the whole night or nobody come so meanwhile I'm like okay I can finally start watching tv and get a beer and then oh then somebody comes so that's been the most disappointing part now I'm in an apartment and I'm actually now I'm gonna be in um Fort Lauderdale for oh for Halloween I'm gonna spend a couple of days next next week when we do this I'll be I'll be live from Florida oh. but I I'd like to get away because no matter what happens with the presidential election I think there's gonna be chaos, so I would rather be somewhere else. <laughs> checking out, we're checking out completely. I'm going home. Yes, I think I'm gonna go. I gotta call my mama. I think I'm gonna go home. <laughs> I don't be Sounds right. good. I'm, I'm just like I, I'm, I might even just like uh, I'll spend these times watching watching sports and turning off the news as much as I can. I'll watch what happens on the election night. I don't know if we'll be decided then, but as soon as we have um, a president and the Senate and everything like that, I'm just gonna kind of tune it out for two weeks. Mm -hmm. Just on my tv shows i started watching entourage again have you ever seen that no but i started watching how to get away with murder so oh that that show starts so good and gets so absurd it's so okay. ridiculous well i'm on episode five and it's amazing so don't ruin it for me it is very good i stopped i watched the first two seasons pretty religiously okay. I, I, like season four i just stopped like this is just okay. so insane now it, it just goes off it's a good show that goes off the rails hmm. as they all do they all do that. Not like this, though. It really takes a turn where you're like, hey, you're like, why am I even watching? This is the most absurd. Like, this could never happen. The first, like, season or two, though, and, and there's good acting in it, but it gets, it gets weird. 
I can't wait to, to get to that point. I'm loving it so far. Um, next week, we will get to deliver. The election will be over, so we'll get to deliver our hot takes on the political season. I think we have to do an extended version of this next week because there's been so much we've been holding in um, because we're not, I mean, we can't talk about anything else, right, e either way um, because of our nonprofit status. But as soon as the election's over, we can kind of give our, our feedback on what happened, wh why we think it happened and everything like that. So well, next week. I'm wearing my vote for the cocktail party t-shirt. <laughs> um, that's what I care about. <laughs> so that's a pretty cool, uh, that's a pretty good uh, t-shirt there. That's really all I care about, the cocktail Most party. of your shirts are weird when they have writing on it but that's a cool one i, I know it's, i'll give you credit credit words do great job taylor good show thank you thank you i'll probably wear this again next week and you know i might have a daytime margarita while we're recording our election takes you never know what's gonna happen that sounds perfect <laughs> I'll, right. I'll be on vacation so i'm allowed to do it heck yeah i love that that'll be perfect well um thanks for joining us and be sure to tune in next week for uh election takes